so thanks all for joining uh, this talk today, this afternoon. Today I want to talk about Coursera and how we've grown, some of our worst blunders and some of the magical discoveries we've encountered over our four and a half year journey so far. For those of you who aren't familiar, Coursera's mission is universal access to the world's best education. We were founded in 2012 by two Stanford professors and we partner with world-class institutions from almost every continent. We help them take their best courses from their best instructors and we put them online so that anyone around the world can take these courses. We have over 20 million learners. We have nearly 2,000 courses uh, from over 150 different partners. But we weren't always this big. When we started, we were actually a very small team. We could all sit around a table and we could all yell at each other whenever someone broke the site, <laughs> which happened every once in a while. Uh, today, however, we've grown quite significantly. We're over 200 people um, and we have over 65 different engineers. And uh, along the way, as we've grown, we've realized that we need to change out some of the technologies that underpin the Coursera learning platform. We've evolved as some things have worked well for us and, and some things really have not. Uh, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. But to understand the motivation for why some technologies have worked and some technologies haven't, it's all about scale. Now, there's the typical scale, uh, you know, dimensions, if you will, of like queries per second, handling a huge amount of load or concurrent users, or handling terabytes or petabytes worth of data in your databases. But actually, while we do have some of these sorts of scale challenges, we have scale challenges in other dimensions. Other dimensions that I, I actually think are harder to handle than these purely technical ones. And the most important one I want to talk about today is the number of types in our ontology. Now as for what I mean by that, I think it's actually best illustrated with an example. If you're a messaging app, and there are great messaging apps out there, you actually have very few types in your ontology. You might have messages, you might have feeds, you might have users. And while there can be a lot of work that, be done, that can be done to power these sorts of things, there's relatively few types in your ontology, relatively few things or categories of things. Coursera, on the other hand, is multiple orders of magnitude larger. So if we just look at Coursera's catalog, the out-of-course experience, we've got courses, instructors, university partners. We also have course lists and specializations and course domains. And we have uh, a huge number of other uh, types surrounding that. But then actually, most of the products actually in the in-course experience. You've got video lectures, you've got in-video quizzes, you've got assessments, you've got peer review, you've got uh, programming assignments, you've got forums. There's so many things that are part of the Coursera course platform. There's so many types. But actually, Coursera is even more of an iceberg. There's a huge amount that happens underneath the hood for authoring and, and versioning of courses and grading and so much more that happens underneath. And Coursera, I think, has a huge number of types in our ontology. And that's the combination of these three dimensions of scale. A more nuanced understanding of scale is what's going to help us trace through what technologies have worked well for Coursera and what haven't. So we're going to go through and we're going to focus on three key technology areas. Our persistent systems, how we, do, how we deploy code, and how we write APIs. So without further ado, let's get started. So we're going to talk first about persistent systems. When Coursera, Coursera was founded, uh, we inherited a PHP in-course platform that was written by a few grad students and undergrad students at Stanford. And they wrote this basically over their winter break uh, and had a whole lot of fun doing it um, and, and a lot of caffeine as well. Now, this, this PHP in-course platform, it was written with basically custom everything. There was no libraries used. There was an own uh, a custom in-house SQL standardization layer, um, an own query routing layer. Uh, it had its own patterns. It had zero unit tests and it had zero documentation. Now, when I joined, you know, it became pretty clear. PHP is a fractal of bad design, right? It's just a horrible system to do anything in, right? Clearly, that's obviously true. Uh, and, 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 you know, we thought we really had to move beyond this. And so we looked around and we realized, hey, you know, a lot of us like Python. Python's, you know, pretty good language. Um, and, and Django is a really powerful web framework. 
It has you know, an ORM. It has uh, a query routing layer. It has powerful plugins for schema management, JSON templating. Like we practically just had to sprinkle a little bit of business logic on Django, and like voila, our app was going to be written. We thought that this was, you know, clearly the solution to all of our woes. Boy, were we wrong. <laughs> so we did have some concerns picking Django and Python. We knew that, you know, Python and Django very slow language in comparison to Scala or C or, or, or otherwise. But we thought. Pff, Scalability, schmalability, we don't have to worry about that. This is horizontally scalable. We can just throw more machines. This is just trivial operations on a cloud provider. You just make an API call and, and grow more hardware. Throw, throw more hardware at the problem, and, and, and it would solve all of our scalability problems. And while we were true, we've never had scalability problems at our CPU or memory layer in our application tier, that was not, that was not where we encountered the scalability problems. We encountered them all in the database layer. And I think to understand what was going on, we first need to look at some numbers. Most users spend most of their time on the in-class experience. That's, the catalog is just to get to the in-class experience. So most of our activity, most of our data, most of our queries were happening on the in-class platform. And we, we had these sharded databases. We gave each database about 15 gigs of RAM. Uh, that was sort of the EC2 instance size at the time. And, and they were serving about 300 gigabytes worth of hot or warm data. By contrast, our catalog, our out-of-course experience, we only had 68, sorry, we were serving just 20 gigabytes of data. But we had to run on a machine of 68 gigabytes worth of RAM just to keep it alive. And to understand why, why we had to so massively over-provision hardware for such a small data set, I think it's best illustrative if we look at an outage. So, this is sort of one of our worst outages that we had, but, but helps really understand what was going on. We, we rolled out a new API Wednesday evening, relatively low traffic time period. Uh, we started using it on our site. Um, we made sure that it all worked, and that was great. But what we didn't realize at the time is that we radically increased the number of IOPS that our database used. So afterwards, after our outage, we, re we what we ended up doing is we ended up launching a big media marketing campaign to say, hey, we've got tons of new courses. Come check them out. Tons of users flooded our site, and we just were totally down for about four hours. Um, but what happened, actually, is that this new query was joining about eight different tables together in MySQL. Because we have so many types in our ontology, the MySQL query optimizer, even though it had perfectly enough RAM to fit all of the data in memory, it ended up spilling intermediary temporary tables to disk. And this ended up radically increasing the amount of IOPS. And when we increased load, we were just totally host. This is an example of why types in your ontology, or the number of tables in your database schema, is a particularly difficult dimension to scale. What's important to understand from this is that it's not the Django ORM that can never scale or handle huge queries per second or huge amounts of load. It's that the Django ORM fails when you have a large number of types in your ontology. So what technologies have worked well for us? Wow, you really can't see that. Sorry about that. We use Slick today. <laughs> Slick allows us uh, to much more clearly express the queries that we need to send to our database, ensure we're not sending O of n queries to our database, ensure we're not joining together up to 12 or 13 different tables, which we've easily seen in our Django uh, slow query logs. Slick works very well for us. But before we adopted Slick, we actually picked up uh, Anorm from the Play Framework. And that also works very well for us. But to be honest, as much as we made fun of PHP as being a fractal of bad design and all this in-house you know, custom framework as being impenetrable and horrible, we never had a problem with just writing SQL and running it against our databases. So that's an important lesson that we've learned. Not all tools scale equally well across all dimensions of scale. Now, as our product evolved, we realized we needed to change a few fundamental assumptions. We previously ran courses between three and four times a year. But we realized that's totally brain dead. This is the internet. You should be able to start a course whenever you want. You should be able to go as fast as you want. Like, this is obvious. Why are we still stuck in you know, 14th century terms of, of, of classes? And so we realized we needed to change the way our in-course experience persisted its data. We could no longer rely 
on our session-based sharding strategy. We needed something that could incrementally reshard with zero operational overhead. And the only database that we felt comfortable with at the time was Cassandra. Netflix had proven that it runs reliably at scale on Amazon EC2. It can handle a huge amount of punishment, uh, both in terms of queries per second, as well as in terms of loss of instances. So we picked Cassandra. We started building on top of Cassandra. And actually, Cassandra's worked. Cassandra has absolutely delivered on the promise of availability, incremental scalability, and relatively low zero operational overhead. We can upgrade the database without taking downtime in ways that we couldn't do with SQL. But it actually has its drawbacks, too. We've found that most developers don't interact with or touch Cassandra directly. It's much more effective for developers to use simpler, higher level of abstractions and not to use the full big table data model that Cassandra exposes. We instead use some automated key value abstractions, and that actually powers the vast majority of Coursera's platform today. But Cassandra doesn't power our catalog. Our catalog is not a huge scale problem. Our catalog is only a few thousand courses, a few hundred instructors, and a few hundred university partners. And an important lesson that we've learned is you don't want to pick the most scalable, most awesome tool for every problem. Don't use the same hammer. There are some problems that are really small in certain dimensions of scale. Our catalog, only a few hundred megabytes to just serve in RAM. But we have a huge amount of queries per second. We use our catalog API for more and more places throughout our site. So what we do is we actually load up the entire course catalog into RAM on the JVM heap of our catalog servers, and we just serve right from in memory. And this works even better than a cache for a number of reasons. In addition to getting lower latency and no network hop, we have true horizontal scalability. We can incrementally add new servers to our catalog tier and serve more and more queries per second concurrently with, you know, ad infinitium. Additionally, you have much better availability and split brain scenarios if you just have everything in RAM. You have a unified failure model, and you don't have to worry about partial failures between your caching tier and your application tier. So this has been a really big lesson learned. For small-scale problems, or rather problems that have a different point in the scale space, so I previously defined three dimensions of the scale space, queries per second, data set size, and types in your ontology, you don't want to pick the same tools and the same technology to solve different points at different point, uh, to solve different problems at different spaces uh, on a scale continuum. So with that, let's move on to our next topic of area, deploying code. Now, as a number of different startups may have started out, it's quite common to just do a git pull on your one application machine, and that's how you deploy new versions of code. And that's exactly how we started. Except for we then had this whole PHP and Python thing, so we had to do git pull on two different machines, and it got to be a bit of a mess. So I wrote deploy.sh, and what it would do is this is a shell script that, first of all, made sure you're running in a screen session, because it's quite often you're going to lose your SSH connection, and you don't want to have the deploy fail in the middle of, uh, or have your connection fail in the middle of the deploy. And then afterwards, it would you know, automate SSH into all the machines, and effectively do a git pull, um, but at least it was behind a script. And, and this was a huge improvement because it meant that instead of deploying like once in a blue moon, we could deploy maybe a couple times a week. And so as a result, what we ended up doing is we actually unified our PHP and our Django into the same boxes so we could have one script just consistently. If you have a problem, just run deploy.sh. It will restore the world to a uniform environment. We had a monolith, or we had a stereolith that we converted to a monolith, and that was definitely better. Unfortunately, deploy.sh really wasn't adopted that much. We wanted to be able to push out code much more frequently. We wanted to have all our developers deploy their own code. And so we built this web console that we call Wayland. Wayland allowed you to, with just a few clicks in a web browser, push out new code, roll it back. We used immutable infrastructure with blue-green deployments. Uh, and this was a huge improvement across uh, compared to our previous infrastructure. We turned on auto-scaling, and we found that developers would gladly deploy their own code uh, up to a point. And we went from deploying a few times a week to deploying a few times a day. But we had a, still a number of problems with this. In particular, it was a monolith. When you wanted to deploy just a small JavaScript change, 
you had to deploy all the Python, all the PHP, and all the other JavaScript. Same wise if you, say, likewise, if you just wanted to deploy a small bug tweak or an improvement in the back end. And because you're deploying so much code, it ended up being a slower, more cumbersome thing, and developers started stepping on each other's toes. And so we launched our second generation deployment infrastructure built around Scala microservices, or rather, we just call them services. And there were a number of key choices that we made as we made this leap to Scala and to, to, to microservices. And we took actually a different tack in a number of different areas. In particular, when you adopt microservices, it's quite common that you allow a polyglot approach. You can use whatever language you want for your service. I'll use whatever language I want for my service. And uh, we'll all just not talk to each other. Um, and we, we actually thought that was the wrong approach for Coursera. And that's because Coursera is evolving so rapidly. We have just barely begun to understand how to teach effectively online. We're constantly reprioritizing and reshifting as new experiments give us new directions to go in, that we needed to have the flexibility to move code between one service and another. We needed to have the flexibility to move one engineer to another service and to move services between teams. And so every service at Coursera is Scala. It all looks the same. It all functions the same. It has the same built-in integrated monitoring so that every service can be monitored in roughly exactly the same way. And we have found that this has actually worked incredibly well for us. Scala is a general purpose language. It is powerful enough, it is scalable, it is fast, that we have no need to have additional languages inculcated into our stack. And this has been an important simplification for us in our second generation. The other big improvement that I want to talk about is that we realized that you really need to keep a very low latency between commit and having your code running in production. Developers running their code, they get reviewed, they go back and forth, they commit. They should then immediately be testing it in production and making sure that it runs reliably. And so our target was actually six minutes from code commit to having it running in production. We've mostly achieved on that. And this has been a big boon in developer productivity and maybe most importantly, developer happiness. Now today, we ended up building all of this with custom in-house tooling, but today, technology's advanced, and these are sort of the tools and technologies that I would take advantage of if I were starting over today. Uh, Kubernetes and Docker are definitely very powerful. There's already a lot of existing tooling around it to support these immutable infrastructure, blue-green deployments, and auto-scaling. Definitely check them out if you're not already. But what I really want to talk about is that these same principles apply not just to back-end services, but they apply to the front-end code as well. We started, we used to deploy our JavaScript you know, with the same back-end services, but we have actually divorced it, and so we have our own, what we call Rapid Dash, uh, that allows us to deploy code in JavaScript just the same way. Immutable artifacts, immutable versions. We've actually integrated it with our unit testing framework and with our monitoring. And this allows our front-end developers to move with much more confidence with, and much more quickly. There's a built-in Control-Z, so if you break the site, it's less than 10 seconds to roll it back. But similarly, in the same learnings from, micro, from monoliths to microservices, we've done the same thing with our JavaScript code. We have numerous single-page apps for our catalog. We have another single-page app for the in-course experience, another single-page app for the authoring environment. And we have other single-page apps that are internal. And so we have Rapid Dose, version 2.0 of Rapid Dash, that is used uh, allows us to break up our front-end monolith and deploy it with immutable builds independently and allow teams to move as fast as they can or as slow as they need to to ensure reliability and consistency. So taking a step back, these are sort of our, our key principles in learning from dealing with uh, a really broad, wide platform, large number of engineers iterating independently. Modular applications and microservices let teams like our assessments team move as slow as they need to. Users get very, very upset if they fill out a whole bunch of questions in an assessment and try and submit it, and it, you know, oops, doesn't work. Like if you're uploading a picture or, or, or whatnot to a, a, you know, a post, you know, if that doesn't work, you, you may say, oh, well, go, I'll, I'll just come back five minutes later. If you just worked for three hours on an assessment, if it doesn't submit and it's 10 minutes till the deadline, you don't just not care. You really, really are upset. So we, our assessments team moves very slowly and carefully, and they can do that and roll things out carefully because they're totally independent from some of our growth teams that are iterating very rapidly in our other pedagogical teams. This has been very important. So the last topic I want to talk about is how we handle APIs. And this is maybe one of the 
the most interesting, the areas I'm most excited about. And this is actually where we really touch Scala. So our PHP environment was Web 1.0. Um, it was, you know, uh, server-side rendered pages from PHP, you know, old school. It worked, but it's boring. So as we started growing, you know, we had front-end devs, and they're like, no, 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 web, web 1.0, no, no, no. Let's do single-page apps, guys. JavaScript is the way of the future. And so we're like, all right, fine, whatever. Uh, what do you want to do this? Like, just give us JSON APIs. JSON, JSON, JSON. They're like, all right, fine. So we started building JSON APIs in Django. And uh, this worked. Uh, for starters, very effectively. There's built-in support for JSON in Python, and, and, and that was great. But as we started building more and more complex APIs, as, we, as our product became more and more featureful, we started pulling our hair out. We'd have dictionaries of lists of dictionaries of lists of dictionaries of dictionaries of dictionaries, and we'd have no clue where we were in the type hierarchy as we were trying to assemble this massive JSON response. We realized we absolutely needed static typing just to, to have developers understand what was going on in the code base. So we played around with Go. We played around with Java. We settled on Scala as the language of choice for our static uh, typed microservices. And we realized that Play, supported by TypeSafe, but, but now Lightbend, was, was going to be the, the, the microservice or the, the core framework that was going to power us. Play was you know, powerful, it's general purpose, it's fast, it's reactive, although we didn't call it reactive at the time, uh, has non-blocking I.O. Uh, we thought that play was going to solve all of our problems. And we were half right. The f way we started adopting play and Scala, we had our existing stack over here um, on PHP and Python. And we decided, you know, let's test this out carefully. So we built our, uh, a separate system, basically totally independent, in Play and Scala. And this was our event tracking system. There are a huge amount of pedagogical insights to be gleaned from realizing how frequently people rewind videos, or where, where they get stuck, or what questions they get wrong. And so our eventing system is that framework that we allow, that gives, lets us show our instructors pedagogical insights to help them improve their courses continually. And that worked very well. So we were like, great. Let's build more stuff in Scala. So we added, we rewrote, our, we rewrote our authentication system into Scala, and we wrote our notification service that handled all emails and mobile push and, and a bunch of other different things as part of our notification service. And those went great. So we're like, let's write. Uh, before we can write more things, though, we needed a way to expose the APIs we wrote in Scala directly to our, um, directly to our web cl and mobile clients. And so in order to do that, we wrote a routing layer that we call Edge that allows us to take requests that come in from our clients, uh, our web clients, our mobile clients, and our third-party OAuth 2-based APIs, and route them to the right service. And this basically unleashed a whole number of new microservices, or just services written in Scala. We have our assessment service. We have our catalog service. We have our course content service and our authoring service. Uh, and as we built more and more APIs, we realized the limitations of play. And the limitations are perhaps best illustrated by looking at the routes file. So there are a few things that you can see by looking at the routes file. And this is almost exactly taken with maybe some slight modifications from our source tree. Um, and the first thing is that it's actually a little cumbersome to write a lot of different REST APIs. It's totally possible. You can use all the HTTP verbs. You can have whatever HTTP query mapping you want. But you end up having a lot of repetition. For example, we have you know, utilities repeated a bunch of times, or slash announcement slash v1 a bunch of times. So it's a little cumbersome. And actually, this is abbreviated. For our wikis, we've got 15 entries in our routes file. We've got over 10 for the utilities, a half dozen for mobile down here at the bottom, uh, and dozens for announcements. Additionally, if you look carefully, you'll notice that we're starting to get a little bit of bike shedding. The first two lines represent you know, the first two announcements API. One is to get all of the announcements, and one is to get just the visible ones. And we actually had a lot of contention. Should the visible be a path parameter? Should that be a query parameter? Should that be a header? You know, it was that definitely unclear. Additionally, we have a huge, broad number of APIs, a huge number of components on our platform. If we have to write, them, write the APIs for them three times, once for iOS, once for Android, and once for web, you know, that's basically a total non-starter. And you see us 
starting to write specific mobile APIs, uh, and, and we were afraid that, of what that might lead to. And so after a number of iterations, after a number of false starts, and after a number of failures, we wrote NapTime. NapTime is the product of our learning of how to build APIs as effectively as possible on top of the Play framework in Scala. NapTime is, of course, open source. You're welcome to play around with it and, and, and use it yourself. Um, it's Scala native. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the presentation. So this is exactly what a sample NapTime resource. If you want to build an API in NapTime, this is literally all the code you need to add a new API. So walking through it, you, know, you define your, your resource. We call them resources instead of controllers, but similar principles apply. You inherit from a supertype that brings in a bunch of helper methods that makes it a lot easier for you to work with stuff. You have two lines of boilerplate that you need to write. You have to define the resource name, and you have to define the version. Everything is versioned. After that, you just write methods just like you would in play. You don't have to write any routing code. You just have to bind it with juice. And voila, you've made a nap time resource. Here we've defined two nap time methods or actions, similar to play actions. One of them is a simple getter, naptime.get. Uh, another one is what we call a finder. There is a, a strict ontology for what APIs are, how they can be represented, what you can do with them, uh, that I'm not going to go into today. What I want to go into, however, is some of the learnings that we've had as we've built NapTime. So if this will not be a guide for how to use NapTime to write your next web service. This will be a guide for as you build your own libraries and as you use libraries, here are the things that worked well for us. So the first thing that I want to talk about we actually use a little bit specific, we're very specific in our types. Now, if you have like uh, an endpoint, like slash API slash courses, you might think that you should actually just have one type as the type parameter, you know, the thing you're returning, the course type. We realize that's actually totally wrong. In addition to making it very difficult to work with persistent systems where you might want to only store the body as a key value type thing, we found that it also is very frustrating when you're trying to do writing or mutating methods where you need to supply a body but not the ID type. The server may be generating the ID type. So when you create a new course, we generate a UUID that corresponds to that course. We want to get just the course name, the course slug, the course description. We, we don't want clients to assign the ID. And by separating out the ID from the body type, that radically simplifies the types that you end up working with. So we model everything as a collection of key value pairs at the type level. Additionally, because we have this separation in types, because we have very specific types, we're able to catch a number of errors at compile time. So if you as a developer accidentally wrote int for the ID type, but you've configured string at the top, we actually don't compile your code. We throw an error. There is no way to have inconsistencies in your APIs at the type level. And this has been very important. It helps developers catch issues before they hit production. Now, how do we do this? Because there's you know, no natural Scala way of doing this. This bind resource, even though you might not realize it at first, it's actually a macro underneath the hood. And that's going to go through it. And when it's generating the routing uh, code for your resource at compile time, it performs a number of checks. And the errors show up right in the right locations where you have the inconsistencies. We put a lot of work into this. And I think that it results in developers that uh, are very happy with the system. So one important lesson that we learned is that we needed to make sure that developers can use nap time without realizing that there's macros or quasi quotes or anything going on underneath the hood. And these APIs reflect that. We put a lot of effort into that. Additionally, we use a number of other powerful Scala language features. We ensure that you have consistency between the types that you return and the types that you've promised uh, in other parts of it. So everything is internally consistent. You cannot return an instructor in the courses resource. You can only return courses in the courses resource. And they all have to match identically. And this consistency really enables client developers to know what they're going to get before they get it. Along the theme of type safety, catching things at compile time, 
it was very important, we realized, to allow abstract data types or arbitrary user-specified types in as many places as possible in the framework. And I think we've done that to a great extent. The ID type can be an arbitrary case class. It can be a courier class, which is Coursera's schema definition language with uh, Scala native bindings, uh, IDE integration with IntelliJ, uh, SBT and Play integration. But also in terms of query parameters, you can bind arbitrary query parameter types anywhere inside NapTime resources. And this was very important to let developers operate at a higher level of abstraction to catch more issues at compile time and to help them work more productively. The final thing that we learned is because NapTime is so opinionated and so strict, we found something that we didn't expect. Client developers benefited from this strictness, this compiler verified consistency very much as well. What we found is that client developers would come to our backend engineers and they would say, hey, I need a finder that takes this query parameter and is on this resource. And the, that very short, brief description let the client developer describe exactly what they wanted to the backend developer. The backend developer knew exactly what they needed to do, and the client developer knew exactly what they were going to get. So having a strong opinionated framework actually helped improve communication. So something we didn't expect. So NapTime uses a number of advanced language features in order to ensure all of this consistency. We use macros, we use quasi-quotes, we use type classes and implicits, we have path-dependent types in there, actually. But what's very important, we put a lot of effort into, is making sure that it's very easy to adopt. If you look back at the code, you don't see any of those advanced language features right up in your face. You don't see very many operator overloading. What you do see is you write your method, you have your query parameters, and you do nap dot. And you can easily, in your IDE, explore what are the available options to you with fill-ins, et cetera. And so we've worked very hard to make sure that developers can very quickly pick up on NapTime APIs. And as a result, we've seen very significant adoption at Coursera. We introduced the framework in late 2013, and we iterated on it a number of times. But once we got to uh, you know, the middle of 2014, developers just absolutely started banging down our door to ask for it. We never prevented developers from using stock play. In every single place, every nap time service is actually a play service underneath the hood, and you can mix and match entirely. But we've just seen a huge takeoff in the use of nap time at Coursera because developers find that it helps them work better. And this is uh, because of all the hard work we've put in. But as a result of this, We've realized that nap time has increased our scalability in terms of the number of types in our ontology. We can now handle the, the rate of growth of nap time APIs because it's so much more optimized, it's so much faster for developers, it catches so many more errors at compile time, it helps them move faster, that we've been able to radically change the shape of our growth curve in terms of the number of APIs that we're able to provide and author over time. So NapTime is a very specific Coursera library. It's open source. You can absolutely use it. We've designed it to be general purpose. But I want to take one further step back and really think, what have we learned at Coursera as a result of NapTime? Scala sometimes gets the rep that it's too hard to learn, that there's too many advanced features, that it's impossible to use. And even more importantly, that there are some libraries that use these advanced language features that are absolutely impenetrable we've found that that's actually not true. If you carefully invest in providing a useful API that's easy to learn, that may or may not have all that great documentation. We've actually done a pretty bad job at documenting nap time for our users at Coursera. But if you provide the right API, you can make it very easy to learn, despite the fact that you're using really advanced language features underneath the hood. We found that type safety, catching bugs at compile time, things that be caught by the type system, and things that can't by using macros, is actually an incredibly useful tool to help developers move faster. And finally, and this is taking even maybe one further step back, the right abstractions may be less general purpose or powerful. And this actually works across all three of my stories. The Django ORM, you can more easily and more efficiently represent more sophisticated queries than in Cassandra, or even necessarily, you know, Slick gets pretty close. But with the Django ORM, you can, it's a lot more powerful, it's a lot more general purpose. And we found that that was the wrong tool. 
deployed on SH. That was SSHing into machines. You could do all sorts of stuff, more general, more powerful. We realized that's not the right tool. A custom web console was actually the right tool to deploy code. Taking away that power, making things safer was absolutely the right thing. And the same thing with play. Play is general purpose. It's very powerful. And we realized that we need something that is opinionated and specific. You cannot build an entire website with just NapTime APIs. Our authentication still just stock play. But there is so much that you can do with the right abstractions that can make you far more productive. And so that's really some of the important things that we've learned. General purpose things may work well for certain levels of scale. Opinionated things or less powerful things work at different dimensions of scale. Now, NapTime has worked incredibly well for our server-side components. But actually, there's more that we can do. And so today, we're using GraphQL to extend type safety from our server components, from our NapTime APIs, all the way to our clients. GraphQL is a type, uh, strongly typed, statically typed specification. And what we've been able to do, actually, because Facebook has discovered the same principles that we have discovered while building NapTime, we've been able to define a bijection. Backend developers at Coursera will continue to write NapTime APIs, and client developers will use GraphQL to access those NapTime APIs. We have a translation layer, a bijection, that allows us to translate incoming GraphQL queries to NapTime and NapTime back into GraphQL on the way out. And in that way, we can take advantage of our optimized Scala APIs and expose them both as REST over HTTP, as well as at the same time over GraphQL, ensuring a smooth, incremental, uh, productive trans uh, transition to this new technology. My time is almost up, but if any of these challenges sound interesting or exciting to you, Coursera is always looking for great people to join our team to advance pedagogy to help us dig deeper in building the right tools for teaching at scale online. With that, thank you very much for listening to me. Any questions? Um, I think we've got a mic coming over. So what tool do you use for, uh, two questions. One, what tool do you use for API documentation? The other one is, uh, what tool do you use for monitoring web services? Great questions. So um, let's see, one thing I forgot to mention, oh, sorry, to repeat the question. Uh, the question is, what tool do we use for uh, API documentation, number one? And then number two, what tool do we use for monitoring? So uh, for, uh, in terms of documentation, um, we built an internal tool. So the NapTime APIs is a huge amount of information that's known statically. Um, but unfortunately, we never invested enough in really exposing that in a really useful interface to our developers. And so what we've done is we're actually using GraphQL to actually provide the type safety and documentation to our client developers. There's a tool called Graphical, and I realize that I probably did not include the slide in Graphical in my appendix, um, that allows developers to incrementally build GraphQL queries, and that's what we're using going forward. It's entirely based off of the NapTime statically type information, but Graphical is a more sophisticated client IDE than we could ever build ourselves. And so we're leveraging the community's work there um, to help make us more productive. As for monitoring, um, that's another uh, yeah, great question. We use a service called Datadog. We have open source a uh, integration between, um, let's see, uh, it's between Coda Hill's metrics library um, from Yammer, and uh, that you're able to basically use Coda Hill metrics library, and we can, you can automatically ship those metrics to Datadog. So we have an open source integration bridge layer that a number of companies are, are, are using, and, and you're also welcome to use. That gives us white box instrumentation. Uh, we use filters to help basically catch a lot of generic sorts of things. So um, we can see how many concurrent requests are in flight. We can see how many 200s, 500s, et cetera, over time. Great question. Another question. So the question is, how many programmers does Coursera has? Um, we have 65 engineers. Um, we're actually growing quite aggressively right now. Uh, we have a lot of work to be doing. Another question. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, this bind resource is a macro that generates a uh, routing layer um, that we then use. It's, we're actually using Juice multi-binding, um, which came in Juice 3.0 or 4.0. Um, 
we then have a special hook in our routes file to basically query this multi-binder inside Juice uh, that we basically then use that to, to, to handle the routing. So we intercept requests um, at the top of the routes file. Uh, and if it can be routed to one of these NapTime resources that's handled, else it just falls through. Does that answer your question? That's a great question. So for this resource right here, if the path is slash courses.v1, that's going to hit this resource. If it's not, then it goes to a different resource. And so you can basically bind a bunch of resources, and they're all non-overlapping paths. Great question. Question in the OK. So the question is, is NapTime a replacement of the controllers or a wrapper on the controllers? And the answer is, NapTime is a replacement for the controllers. Developers don't write controllers anymore. They instead write NapTime resources. And we hook in, play as a powerful general web framework, and they provide a lot of amazing hooks to be able to customize play as you need it. And we take advantage of that um, so that, that we basically intercept the requests and handle the routing in that manner. Uh, so the question is, is this a wrapper on a Play app or otherwise? This is just a library that fits inside a Play. So all of our services are actually Play services. They just happen to intercept the requests, route them through nap time, and generate standard Play responses underneath the hood. But developers have operated a higher level of abstraction that's easier to test, have more specific types, and has all of the static documentation that we're able to glean automatically. Question in the back I saw first. Thank you. Takeaways, which I completely agree with. Uh, one was uh, the abstraction layer, and people don't have to understand the, the, uh, the advanced uh, features of the language. What if those features fail, uh, and uh, then the percent themselves is just huge stack traces that no one understands, unless you write the library itself? Uh, how do you provide support for that? Uh, how do you document this thing? Uh, specifically, you know, someone ends up with this uh, stack trace and So I'm going to take that in the reverse order. The first question is, how do we measure the productivity gain? And you may have to remind me of the first question, which I'm going to answer second. Um, so how do we measure the productivity gain? The first is we actually just looked at the source code. Um, we're able to see that we're able to produce more types more efficiently. So Coursera as a platform is very, very broad. We're able to build more features. Each, each nap time resource, they're all very, because they're all very strict, they all follow a very specific schema. We can actually tell how many types in our ontology we're able to add. And before nap time, we were adding them very slowly. And afterwards, we were able to add them more quickly. And this means that we can add more and more features more and more quickly. Additionally, we also have the quant this is our quantitative feedback. Our qualitative feedback is, of course, that developers are, are happy with nap time and that they uh, just use nap time instead. Um, so that's sort of how we've, how we've measured it. And we feel, we feel pretty confident that this is incredibly well optimized for Coursera's uh, needs for scale along Coursera's scale dimensions. The first question is, so we use a number of advanced language features. What happens when they fail? Do developers just tear their hair out um, or, or, or get very confused? And that's a very good question. Um, it's hard to basically get it exactly right. In general, most of these are actually fixing issues at compile time or catching issues at compile time. There's actually relatively zero. Uh, for the most part, zero runtime overhead for any of these sorts of things. Like macros run entirely at compile time. Um, and the way we've structured it, uh, you know, we avoid all exceptions everywhere. And if user code generates exceptions, we catch them and log them appropriately. The macros, if the macros fail in the invocation, we, we try very hard to actually, um, that's a bug in the macro if they fail. And because macros give you enough power to write custom error messages in the compiler that show up with exact the right line numbers, when you actually have the inconsistency that I illustrated here, where you have an int when you actually expected your ID type to be a string, we're actually able to, and in your IDE, it shows up exactly as a red underline right here saying expected a type string. Instead, you gave me an int. 
Um, for the uh, type classes and implicits, we're able to take advantage of the annotation at implicit not found to give custom error messages and help developers do the right thing. Path-dependent types, we use those very sparingly. But we use it very carefully to ensure that it's the right thing and uh, uh, the right type is being used in consistency across a number of different nap time resources. And uh, for the most part, we haven't had too many problems with that just because we use it for just one very careful area where no other feature would do. And, and, but it's a very straightforward use case when you have this tool in your language toolbox to build these advanced libraries. So um, we do different things. In general, the most important thing, because all this is at compile time, give good compiler error messages with the right line in the source code where things, things end up breaking, and that, and that helps a lot. All right, uh, if you have any further questions, I'll be here for a few more minutes afterwards, but I think we're out of time. Again, thank you very much for listening to my talk today. <laughs>